Grace and peace to you on this day. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Twelve years ago now, I was a intern pastor, student pastor. Kind of like student teaching, but in the church. And the pastor that I served with, his name was Bill Carter, went on sabbatical for the summer. And so I was left in charge. One of the things that he did while he was on his sabbatical is he uh, wanted to go to Collegeville, Minnesota. Because there is a little abbey there uh, that's kind of famous in the region. Uh, there's a, a group of monks that pray every day and wanted to do that. They were starting to write, or they're in the middle of writing the St. John's Bible, which is an illuminated manuscript, handwritten. They wanted to do that like the old way. And they have an archived old library. He wanted to do all that. And he did all that. And while he was there, he went to church with them. And the father, the friar, the monk, whoever it was, uh, whose turn it was to preach, got up into the pulpit and uh, read this passage of Scripture. Uh, Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. And he paused for a second. And he said this. You know, I've been thinking about this for some time. And I think it's true. We are his mother and his brother and his sister. And then he sat down. That was it. That was the whole sermon. No amen. No uh, explanation further than that. No great personal stories. Nothing. Just that sentence. You know, I think it's true. We are his mother and brother and sister. It's tempting to just sit down right now. <laughs> Especially after a long synod assembly. That would be great. But I was thinking about that. Because it's one of those stories that I've been thinking about for a very long time, 11 years. And uh, this passage rarely comes up. It usually is hit, either hidden by Pentecost or Holy Trinity Sunday, and we don't read it. I think it's been almost eight, nine years since we've heard it, uh, on a Sunday morning anyway. Thinking about it, it, it raises for me a question. I know Jesus makes a statement, you know, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. But it raises the question for me, you know, who is your true family, really. And I can think of three easy answers to that. You've got your uh, blood relatives, and you've got your uh, like-minded people, and you've got um, kind of a spiritual connection as to what that can mean. I mean, you know your, your blood relatives, you actually have a mother and a brother and a sister and a cousin or whoever it is that is your family. You know all those people that drive you crazy? Them. <laughs> Sometimes we uh, are close to them, Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we uh, see them on a regular basis. Sometimes we haven't seen them in years. Uh, some of them may no longer be living. But they're still our family, right? And we know that. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about. Then there are kind of your uh, like-minded people. You know, your friends. You know, the people that you could tell anything to. The things you would tell something to that you wouldn't tell your mother. Those people in your life. I hope you have those people in your life. I am fortunate enough to have a few. But I want to tell you about my friend uh, J. Jeff. You know him when he comes up as a regular character in the sermon sometimes. Uh, it was 18 years ago that I met him. And we became uh, fast friends. And we started actually behaving like brothers. I mean, we'd wrestle. We would uh, argue playfully. We would discuss things deeply, and uh, we really cared for each other right, right away. And I think because we share a name, it was also kind of this, this other piece. Our identity was kind of recrafted into J. Jeff and G. Jeff, and we both liked that. To the point where we really started to kind of go with it. We started to tell kids at camp, we actually were brothers. Which makes no sense. Why would you name two kids the same name? You don't look alike. <laughs> He's bigger than me. So we came up with this whole backstory to make this work. Uh, we said our parents had split up. That's why I grew up in Chicago. And he grew up in central uh, Wisconsin. Uh, we made up this long tale about a dead uncle. And uh, his dying wish was to have the child named after him. And Nobody knew it was twins, and so he was born first, and it was Jeff, and I, he was a surprise, so I happened to do that. So G. Jeff and J. Jeff. 
and kids believed it. <laughs> One time we're walking through campus, a couple of years later, a couple of summers later, we're on the way to work on something. I don't remember when we heard this arguing happening, so we thought, we better break this up. And it was two kids facing each other, one with clenched fists, not ready to punch the other one, but just very passionate. Uh, and the other person kind of doing this at him. And as we got closer, we heard what they were talking about. And he was saying, they are brothers. I know that for a fact. And they told the whole story of the uncle. And we just kept walking. <laughs> I hope you have people like that in your life. Because they really are like family. But Jesus isn't really talking about that. Uh, then there's the spiritual connection. You know, we talk about church as a family. It's a nice thing to say. We like to say it. Uh, sometimes, sometimes that's a hard word because people have broken families and they don't know what to do with it. But I think overall, we like to hear that. Church is like a family. We're all children of God. We use the term brothers and sisters a lot. And uh, it makes sense. Especially when you start to look around. Because just like in your family, you have that crazy uncle in a church and you have that uh, you know, strange aunt and a you know, peculiar cousin, and you start to look around, you realize that that's you. And uh, it really is about that, that all of us are, are welcome here with whatever baggage we bring, and yet we're still loved and supported by one another. And yet Jesus isn't exactly talking about that either, really. He calls us to something much deeper than that, much deeper than our our friends, much deeper than our church community, much deeper than even our relatives. It says, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. The story that kind of plays out in this story, when Jesus goes home, I think he just wanted a nice home cooked meal, really. Uh, he's, he's out with his disciples who we recently Call. He's been doing all these amazing things like uh, healing the sick and casting out demons, whatever we can understand that to be or mean, proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come. And it, it's exhausting. He's, he's coming home. And his family is gathered there. And we don't know exactly who they are, but we know some of the players are. I mean, we got Mary, his mother. I mean, we know who she is. Especially around Christmas time, we think about her. We think about what that meant for her to follow God by actually having a child. He does have a crazy cousin. He's got John the Baptist as a blood relative. Can you imagine? What's that like at the dinner table? And uh, there's Joseph. Um, is he a stepfather? Is he an adopted father? Is, is, who is he really? But he's, he's there too, i got to think. You know, there's the stories of Joseph. There, there aren't many of them. You don't hear a lot from him. Uh, he's, he's the one that uh, has a dream and says, yes, I'll, I'll continue to marry Mary anyway, uh, even though he's scared to do that. And the last time you hear from him is that story when Jesus is in the temple after they had left, and they can't find him, and they're frantically looking, and uh, Mary and Joseph come back to the temple, and uh, they're ready to kill this kid. Where have you been? And uh, he says, I'm in my father's house. Now, if you're Joseph, that's got to stab hard. And it doesn't say who says this, and it doesn't even say it in these words, but I have to think Joseph is the one that kind of says to Jesus, you know, you've been doing some really good stuff, but it's time to get a real job. Uh, it's time to settle down. It's time to, it's time to buck up, buddy, and, and do what you should be doing. And uh, that's, that's hard to hear. I wonder how Jesus took that. And I've, I've had that conversation. I've been on the receiving end of that conversation. Maybe you've Share those words with somebody you love. It's hard sometimes to hear. Uh, Jesus also is with his uh, disciples. Kind of a band of brothers, if you will, in a certain regard. I mean, he certainly loves them like brothers. Uh, the story right before this, they're actually named. These are the twelve disciples. You know, James and John and Peter, Judas even. They're all there. He's brought them, he's brought them home to dinner. And they're around him. But I think Jesus expands that a little bit. It's not just talking to them, really, either. That you're my family now, and I'm not going to go home again. He's not saying that, I don't think. But there's this other group of people, too. I mean, they're kind of the crazy uncle and the strange aunt and peculiar cousin, this church family. 
called the scribes here. They're the religious people. And they, they find out reject Jesus. They know that he's been doing all these amazing things. That he's been healing people from real illnesses, the real brokenness in their lives, forgiving them in a way that they've never heard before, and them hearing that as truth, welcoming them to be part of something bigger. He's been casting out demons, calling out the evils in the world in which we live and he enters. He's been telling people about the kingdom of God. And for them, they don't have a category for that. Either he is the true son of God, or he's of the devil, and they know his family are over there. I mean, really? Jesus? Can't be. And they flat out reject him. So he says these words, those who do the will of God are my true family. They're my brother and my sister and my mother. It was interesting over the last two days, this wasn't originally part of the sermon, but something I've been thinking about overnight. Uh, we elected a new bishop in our synod, and it's been kind of an interesting process to watch. I mean, I kind of knew what it looked like on paper, but I hadn't really watched it happen uh, before. You walk into this convention hall, and the meeting starts, and the first order of this business is everybody gets a sheet of paper, and you can write down any name you want, any pastor in the church. And as you can imagine, about 150 people had their name written down. I even had a couple of us, who knows? Uh, and then what you do is, uh, if you don't want to run, you go outside in the hallway where they have a big, long list of everyone and you kind of sign out that you're not going to do that. So I, I went out to go do that and saw a bunch of colleagues running around. Uh, some of them saying, yeah, I'm going to run, and then everybody else looking for where their name was on the list, including me. Uh, and after I did that, I was able to come back and actually take a deep sigh and enjoy the rest of my weekend. And the next part was just really interesting to watch. Because I had always kind of thought of this process as a real kind of political thing. Uh, of people being accepted and rejected in that real kind of way. And it didn't seem that way to me, honestly. Uh, there was another ballot where the people that had not taken the name off was back. They filled a whole sheet of paper, probably about 40 people. And that got whittled down to seven. And then they put seven people in a row of chairs uh, to answer some questions, kind of like a panel. And what I thought, and maybe you two could think about this too, what I was watching really were their eyes. Because first there was this, not quite deer in the headlights look, but this almost gleaming glare of, wow, this could maybe happen for me. And within seconds, after they each spoke for the first time answering a question, it was like a heap of bricks landed on them, and it was like, dear Lord, this could actually happen for me. And as the group got smaller, and people were not rejected, it wasn't about that at all. It was more about just trying to follow what the will of the group was and discern for themselves and prayerfully think about what God was up to with them. Uh, the glimmer in their eye changed again. And more, it was now just kind of this um, determined possibility that's a phrase totally unsure of what could happen next, and still not uh, planning out answers really, but just answering faithfully and accepting whatever happened next. And as I get down to two people, uh, one of them a good friend of mine, and uh, the other person who was elected, uh, <coughs> it was really interesting to watch that. And they got to address the assembly at uh, one part, and uh, my friend, whose name is Tim, uh, Slovich, he, uh, he gave this great, uh, just impassioned, faithful statement. He said, you know, in our synod we've got 185 churches, and if you look at the numbers, 123 of them are in decline. That's true. And if you look at uh, other denominations, that's true too. And if you look across the country, that's true too. And if you look across the West, that's true too. He said, uh, this I like, actually. He said the uh, Southern Baptist Convention in the last decade has lost two and a half million members, which is the size of the Episcopal Church. He didn't say that, but I knew this was true. Or the Missouri Synod, the uh, Lutheran Church. Take your pick, which one's that? Uh, and that to me was, uh, wow. This is not just a little thing. Uh, but he said 
said this, and I'm not going to do it as good a justice as he did, but he said, you know, uh, to follow Jesus means you go to the cross. And that's where things die. And Jesus dies there. And when he invites us to follow him there, uh, he invites us to leave our fear there so we can die. And he even invites us there so that we would die too. Because out of death comes life. And out of the cross comes Easter. And we have nothing to be afraid of. And I thought that was brilliant. I mean, that's what Jesus means, those who do the will of God. It's not a long checklist of things we have to cross off or we're out. It's about following Jesus to our death. It means leaving our worries at the cross. It means knowing that whatever happens next, whatever that is, uh, the glimmer in our eye changes from that maybe possibility of, oh, good things are happening, to, oh, that means a lot of work, to, but God's doing something here. And I want to thank Tim for that, because it was an amazing witness of his own faith, and it was a reminder for me, truly, of what's, what's real. I mean, it's not how many people come on Sunday, it's not how great a picnic we put on, though I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's not about uh, a lot of things we worry about all the time. Whether it is our friends or family or ourselves, or keeping this place running, or who we're going to welcome or who we're not, or what the next day looks like. It's not really about that. It's about following Jesus. Even though we are the crazy uncle. Even though we are the strange aunt or the peculiar cousin, and we come with a lot of baggage too. But that really is the truth of the gospel, and it's the truth of our lives together. That whatever happens next, it's one step closer to the cross, because that's where new life happens. <laughs>